Hey, uh, good morning, everybody, and um, thank you to, uh, to Bradley and Philippa for the kind introduction. Um, thank you also for the opportunity to be with you all, uh, at least virtually today. Um, very much looking forward to sharing some perspectives with you um, and hopefully giving a slightly um, wider uh, perspective than we sometimes get from the automotive community on how and where some of these simulations can add value. So um, the, the title of the session has been around, uh, would you trust simulations with your life? Um, I wanted to think in terms of, well, what, what if we could trust those simulations? What would need to be true and how would we get there? Okay, so um, for the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes, I'm going to share, share some thoughts on that um, and uh, hopefully look forward to taking some questions at the end of it. Okay, so um, if we were meeting in person, uh, you'd have some bit more of a perspective of who I am, uh, skipping around being slightly daft in a room. Um, I'm an engineer by background. I've been working in and around the transport uh, systems world for about uh, 18 years or so. Um, initially, some work in automotive, aeronautics, and then on into um, research, looking at vehicle emissions and building up from there. Um, increasingly, we began using simulation tools. Um, and as we built up our labs at Imperial, we realized that that was becoming a bigger and bigger part of what we needed to do. Um, I left, the, left Imperial to join the Catapult in 2014, and then we quite rapidly were working with um, the UK industry and Department of Transport around the next generations of these methods and how they could add value for looking at the modeling intelligent mobility. So the next generations of these mobility services. Um, out of that, we span out a company called Immense, um, which uh, has now grown somewhat bigger than it was. It was originally a bad joke of a small company called Immense. Um, and so, so what, what, what is Immense? Where, where, who am I here representing? Um, so we're a, we're a simulation company. We, we have built a simulation platform that we make uh, accessible to users from across many different sectors where they're trying to ask and answer questions about uh, mobility systems. So not, not the, the component level details of how um, the subsystems of the vehicle work or how they interact, but how we look at how millions of vehicles and people interact within our world to deliver uh, effective, valuable mobility services, what that implies for infrastructure and what that means for planning and the system management as a whole. Um, we've, we make those tools as accessible as we can. So we've um, put a lot of work into build, being able to access these tools from wherever you are, running it from an iPad, running it from um, even from your phone. Um, and the key point for us is about empowering decision makers to make better decisions about mobility systems, to deliver that, that vision of the seamless mobility system of the future. Okay, so with that said, um, why, why am I here today? So um, I was very uh, kindly invited to speak by uh, Jeff and um, Bradley and the team to give a slightly uh, wider perspective of well, what, what are we doing with these great bits of technology that uh, we can develop and we can deploy. And um, the perspective I take on this and we bring through to it is that transport is all about systems. It's, all, it's, a, it's a big system of systems. And it's fundamentally about people and why we look to travel, um, where we look to travel, when and how we do that safely and effectively. Um, that involves infrastructure, involves the services, involves the wider engagement with society. Um, and it involves lots of cases and it involves lots of questions. And those cases are usually about, is this a good idea? Um, whatever concept or solution has been dreamt up. Uh, and that could be a solution from a, from a politician or from an engineering team who've come up with some great potential uh, way of solving some of our problems. And goodness knows we have lots of problems in transport. And um, one of the key points here in the simulation session is that the big value proposition here is about formalizing testing and being able to repeat it and being able to do it at scale. Um, and my key contention here is that simulation is an absolutely core enabling capability of that not just in engineering development, but in all of the other stages around that that help you develop and deploy the right solutions in the right places at the right time uh, to do so in an effective, cost-effective, safe, uh, profitable, hopefully, uh, way, okay? Um, 
The other important point to make up front is that simulation is it isn't um, it doesn't give you the answer. It gives you a set of tools to explore implications to test um, what alternatives, what could happen. So they're decision support tools. They're not decision making tools. Um, and they um, one of the challenges in the um, uh, title of the series this morning is would you trust the simulation to decide for you? You have to be very, very, very confident in everything around it. And I want to share a little bit about how we think about some of that. One of the subtitles, is it time to trust simulations with our lives? So I want to break this down and share a few, few thoughts on it as we go through, hopefully spark some conversation. So let's start by talking about our lives because that's quite an important part of this. So I want to introduce a, a group of people to you. And um, these are sim people. These are, um, they're a lot like you and I and everybody else we know. Statistically, they're exactly similar. Um, but they live their lives in a digital world. They're constrained to undertake their activities um, according to rules that we set for them um, and that we configure based on all the data that we can, can glean about how behavior is made. Um, and there are lots of these people. There are millions and millions of them, billions around the planet. And they're different and they have different habits and behaviors in different places. And in product development, you would think of these as your market, your target market, your users. So we actually do have quite a lot of data about how we live our lives. And this is something that's improving massively um, year on year at the moment. We have far better insights and information about what we do and how we choose to do it. Um, and many better methods of uh, anonymizing that and turning it into really consistent, useful information. What I'm showing here is a dashboard. Um, so what sits behind a lot of simulations like ours is a synthetic population. So um, on the left-hand side, you can see a, a dashboard which is focused around um, the center of the country, so around Birmingham, uh, looking at um, who lives there, what do they do, what, how the household structured, what types of tenancy, what types of other characteristics that might influence their, their trip making, their travel behavior, um, or their willingness to pay, or their ability to uh, make certain types of journey, or to access certain types of transport mode. From that, we can get good structural idea about how a place may behave in different circumstances. We also have trend information. So on the right hand side here, you're seeing um, some of the UK Department of Transport's information and projections around um, how our trip making is changing. So even over the last 15 to 20 years, we've seen quite significant changes in trip making pattern. And um, we're doing things differently to the way we did previously things can change really fast so we're all living through a very uncertain um, disrupted disturbed time and some data here is um, some work colleagues at uh, a UK company called Vivacity have been doing on behalf of the Department for Transport by turning some of their monitoring sensors into probes to look at um, vehicle counts and uh, different trip making so what you're seeing here is a, is a time series over the, uh, the lockdown period uh, the past weeks and months and um, and you can see how there's very, very significant drops in tra travel. Um, so car, pedestrian, right down low here, red and yellow. And then uh, the big brown spikes at the weekend. I think I said I was a lapsed cyclist, like probably many of us. Um, lots of people are getting on their bikes out of the weekends. And obviously this varies by count site. It varies in different parts of the country. Um, but there's also some interesting trends you can see around economic change in terms of the increase in van usage and the recovery of the um, freight system um, as people have adapted to the supply chains being disrupted. Um, but things can change really fast and we, we don't know what's going to happen in a few months time and even a few years time, whether those trends that we've been seeing for the last um, decades will continue. They probably won't or they might, might in very different ways or it might affect different people in different parts of the population very differently. Um, and that all has an impact on how we deliver effective transport, but also how we build and prove and deploy safe, effective technologies and solutions into that. And there are new opportunities in this as well as challenges. Okay, uh, so the next point, and this is probably where I want to spend the, a, a few minutes, is talking about trust in simulations. So uh, simulations, from my perspective, are, are tools. Um, and you have a, a specific tool for a specific purpose. So you want to need to start off with knowing why. 
why are you simulating? What are you trying to achieve with that, with that tool? So in, in, in our world, in our perspective, we, we look at the use of simulation to test things that we can't do easily or cost effectively or um, in, a, in a physical test environment. Um, they might be very complex scenarios to set up. Um, it may be very difficult to get enough data to re replicate things consistently um, enough, fast enough. Um, it could be too expensive to do. Um, it could be really dangerous. Um, it could be a set of tests that you don't actually ever want to see happen, but you really, really need to be able to test the implications of that future alternative, that um, scenario, the incident response, that you need to know what you will do if that ever happens and be able to, do, to respond to it. So all the edge cases and the corner cases and those types of things. Um, the purpose is, I think, very simple about managing risk. It's about being able to make better informed decisions. And it's about doing that uh, effectively where either you can't afford to fail and or you can't have access to enough development resource or time to be able to um, stand up and run full scale um, physical tests. Very often the questions we're asking are about the future and we don't know. So we don't know what the UK is gonna look like in travel behavior terms in 2021. We've got lots of hypotheses and we need to be able to test those scenarios and simulation tools are a superb way of doing that um, and being able to rapidly get better insights. But they're a tool and they have limitations. So the way we tend to set things up is we ask what if questions. So what if, and actually what we mean is what if, what might happen, what might happen if these people choose to do this, these vehicles behave in these sets of ways that we've configured, and these other agents interact with them in these ways, uh, and the environmental conditions are like this. If it rains, if it's, um, if the uh, electrical supply is disrupted, if your EV recharging, or whatever else it is. So you, you build these test scenarios, and then you explore trade-offs and look at how these candidate solutions perform. So you run experiments, you run sweeps. Um, and in our transport simulations case, we're looking at people, vehicles, infrastructure, and all the interactions between them. And usually the outturn metrics we're interested in are the transport system performance, um, the individual um, utilization within that, uh, the economic impact, and then perhaps the energy um, and environmental impacts of what's going on around it. Okay, so we need to have somewhere that we can run this test scenario. So we, we've put a lot of our time and effort into building these digital worlds. So building, building our test bed, building our digital um, environment. And um, some things we've learned and many others have learned and we all intuitively know is that building a good lab costs money and time and it's quite difficult to do well. And you need to bring together lots of different elements to do it. You have to prepare really carefully. You have to keep your lab clean. You have to keep it tidy, to keep it organized. And in that, working with uh, data with strong provenance and governance around them really helps. So a lot of initiatives around standardizing data types. Um, in an adjacent sector, the Center for Digitally Built Britain is building some um, digital twinning methods for, for the country based on civil infrastructure, which in time will become a hugely valuable resource for, the, um, for these, these testing communities. There's an implication of this, which is that sharing those assets becomes really important because um, there is rarely enough single use case to want to own and maintain your own full asset. And actually being able to reuse that and um, not have to rebuild it every time you want to do it um, to maintain it um, is hugely important. Um, in that, in a digital sense, um, we always look to leverage some of the global partnerships and supply chains around this. There are huge amounts of really high quality data that are being procured and maintained for all sorts of other good reasons, not just simulation for transport. And so then a few points around what we do with it. So we build up, we, we, this is our, uh, our doorstep where our, um, <laughs> until recently our office was um, in Milton Keynes. So what we start to do is build up simple things where we look at the travel times on the network, what you're seeing here is isochrones at different times of day. You have that flowing over the whole day. Um, and then we run tests. And here you're seeing a really simple illustration of 
um, a set of routes and trips at different times of day and seeing whether we recover known effects. So you see, uh, we tend to get congestion building up in this part of the network in the morning. Um, so we get um, vehicles rerouting their trips around it. So far, so good. Um, clearly that test on its own isn't enough to prove that you've got anything that you can trust. And it's all about building layers of trust in those methods. So we've worked quite extensively with teams in the, in the US um, and partners in the States. And so a lot of the mobility innovations have come out of um, organizations around, in and around Silicon Valley. They're certainly keen to test things there. So we've been looking at um, the same block, um, midnight rush hour um, travel times in the Bay Area, and then looking at whether we recover again, simple expected known effects. So here you can see we're picking out a toll plaza on the San Mateo Bridge, where we are getting vehicles coming down to a stop consistently and recovering that sort of behavior. Again, encouraging. This is something that's running with millions of entities and is consistently reproducible. So, so far, so good. We believe it a little more than we did. We then take some of this to some of the reference data sets. And this is where some of those shared facilities really, really come into their own. So what you're seeing here is an open data set that's published routinely by uh, New York City around taxi activity. And it's become one of the gold standard test cases for um, mobility fleet simulation. So you can see our network that we've built up. Um, you can see the activity patterns of the taxi fleet and then comparisons between sim and data. So here we're looking at the, the distribution of trip distances, how that spreads over the course of a day. You can see there are some slight offsets in the middle of the night which then gives us somewhere to go and look to investigate what's going on and understand what's happening in our sim and improve things to get a more trusted environment. Once we're comfortable with that, we can then look at different test scenarios. So in this case, um, just in Manhattan, I think we're looking at a few million trips a day and there are months and years worth of data. So you can start looking for specific test cases and understanding if you really perform well on a wet Tuesday in Stoke um, or the Manhattan equivalent. Um, and get a good handle on when and where and how much you can trust your simulation tools. Come back to London, come back home. Um, so here we're looking at some mobility services. So we've work, been working with partners to look at fleet performance. Um, again, similar, similar time-based plots. Um, but then on the right-hand side, seeing some of the more detailed analytics dashboards that you can start to run. So comparing a and B, so in this case, two different simulation cases where we're looking at different uh, settings and different performance. Being able to interpret in quite a lot of detail what's happening, being able to look into individual patterns of behavior and the maps that come behind them, looking at individual vehicles and how it's following a stop pattern. Is it active where it should be, when it should be? Um, and being able to confirm that with um, uh, layers of expert um, testing to build automated tests that mean we can prove to ourselves that our system is still good and still, and still reliable and still robust and then to start looking at the passenger behavior in that and, and so on and so on. Okay. One of the strengths of these sorts of methods is that they're, they're agent based so you have full detail around each of the individual elements and so once we have trust in our methods, what we can do is then replicate them in different places. And so what you're seeing here is, oh, how many that is, six by eight, so 48. So we, we can build, we build and deploy hundreds of cities um, using the same methods. What that means is that we have a consistent reference platform, whether or not that is at true in absolute terms, it means that at least we can get a good comparator of the relative effectiveness in different places and when we do localized validation on them as we go through. And again, that's building, again, starting to build trust in our decision making around it and where we have uncertainty, making sure that we can characterize it. A key part of that, and this is where I want to talk a little bit about the UK's activity and position, is um, collaboration across parties and across sectors. So we've been very privileged to be part of the UK's connected autonomous um, testing community for the last um, few years. In fact, it's actually where the company uh, was founded from. Um, one of the live programs at the moment is around the um, connected vehicle data exchange complex, which is uh, being built and will be deployed later this year, where it's all about being able to exchange data sources to be able to provide better 
test cases environments for people to accelerate their developments and do a better job of deploying good, profitable, effective um, technologies. Um, it's been a really unusual collaboration across public and private sector. Uh, it's been very effective. Um, it's been uh, focused in the West Midlands, but is developed as a national facility. It's supported through the, um, the government's um, Testbed UK initiatives. So on that, and I think there's some other announcements coming here um, in parts of the day. Um, okay, so what, what, what you're seeing here is the, um, the trailer video for some of the uh, developments across the wider UK testbed ecosystem. So Convex is just one part of um, a, a network of facilities that many of you will be already be familiar with or party to, um, which is helping to us to give the test infrastructure, both physical and digital, to enable people to come and test their solutions in the UK and to enable UK technologies to be taken out to a global, global stage through various connections. Um, there's a series of um, uh, video explainers and talks that are being launched from this morning. I think we're two hours past the press embargo. So um, I don't know if that counts as a world exclusive, but um, I think I'll take it. Um, but the principle here is that these assets are of much greater value by being shared and resourced and supported across the community. Um, oh, okay, so the last point I wanted to ask is around, um, is it now? Is it time to trust these simulations with our lives? And so mobility is changing very fast. There's been enormous amounts of material written over the last years. There are intersecting use cases, both for the services, the infrastructure operation, and for the strategic planning, that all can make use of the same digital test environments. Okay, so some of the, some of the scenarios where we, we, would have, we would have perhaps done well to stress test some of these solutions before we rolled them out. Um, and then some final concluding thoughts, um, I'm conscious I'm up at time. So um, simulation tooling in all the different forms is a really important part of managing risk and decision-making. Um, it's value lies in us testing things that we can't do in other ways and doing it faster or cheaper or better. Um, I have a, a very strong personal belief that um, making those tools more accessible and um, more reusable is a key part of us um, achieving our objectives around technology deployment. And I think a final point um, for the, from this UK perspective is that we really do have some great capability here in the UK, which we should be proud of, but we should also use rapidly to help us make better decisions as we're navigating some of these really challenging times. Um, and that's all I had. That's perfect. No, no, thank you very much indeed. That's brilliant. No, really, really, again, a, a different take on things for us. Um, but but no, very very much appreciated. Now we've got lots of questions. Um, but, but again, I think we're going to have to be relatively mean um, for you, and, and then and then ho hopefully hold more questions for the panel. But we've got two. Um, one from Ragu, and we're going to again be brave and try and bring Ragu on to uh, ask his question direct. Are, are you there, Ragu? Hello. Can you hear me now? Uh, ah, yes, we can. Thank you, Ragu. Go on. Uh, go ahead yeah. and ask a question, Robin. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much. The the presentation was really good. Uh, my question to you is uh, simulations today depend still a lot on the test data for validation and verifications. Would that change in the future? And if it does change, then to what does it change to and would it impact? And can we say then that we trust the simulations? It's, it's, a, really, it's a really good question, Raghu. And um, obviously simulations are bound up in the, in the data that goes into configuring the models. Um, what what most in most cases what we do is we do two stages we do a backcasting effort to compare to measured data so we can gain trust in our model in our methods and how they're behaving um, but then actually many of the use cases are forward looking and nobody's got data about 2025 yet so um, if you're looking into those uh, what if something is different is structurally changed um, for all their flaws, simulation tools are a really important part of how we ask those questions and get useful answers. Um, but the data is critical to get trust in the underlying methods. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Reggie. Thanks very much for your question. Philippa? Okay, yeah, and now I believe we've got um, a keynote from yesterday, uh, Neville Jackson.
great you've come to join us and I think you're going to ask us a, a question. Uh, hi Robin, very nice presentation. Uh, just a question about the ability to predict accurately. So you quote a number of use cases that you use to validate the model, but always with validating models, we have to make assumptions. And it's very easy to tune those assumptions to correct for any errors you might see in past data. Yep. What, is, what is the future? How do we avoid having to do that? How do we make predictions to be more accurate? And can we predict confidence limits? Uh, it's, it's a really good question. And I think there's, there's two parts to an answer on it, I guess. What, one is that um, we always have to maintain a discipline about not, I guess, not marking our own homework so that we, you can't uh, validate against data that you use to calibrate your model. Um, you have to have some level of independence in the test case. Um, so it's why data sets like the New York taxi set are so valuable because it's such a large resource that you can very happily build and test and calibrate on one part of it and then test on a completely independent part. What we then try to do is transfer those methods to a completely new geography and or a new uh, test case and environment and get some level of confidence in the comparison. Um, is that improving? Yes, it is. Um, the data is more available. Um, a lot of the methods that are coming through from the machine learning community are giving us tools to um, better tune and faster calibrate these sorts of tooling. Um, but we still need to be really mindful about where we're um, extrapolating or interpolating um, and what the implications are. Um, it, can we get there? I d I'm not sure where there is, but we can, we're can. we definitely making big strides in that. Uh, and I see that continuing for some years to come. Neville, is that okay? Are you happy with the answer? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm sure we could chat a long time on that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. No, Neville, thanks very much indeed. Thanks again for joining us today as well. Robin, thanks ever so much. And obviously we'll hope to welcome mm -hmm. you back shortly to be part of the panel.